Hello and welcome to the first Blood Brothers podcast of 2023. Um, joined tonight by Sean. Hello, Sean. Hello. And we are robless for our first episode of the year. Um, but our guest tonight more than makes up for Rob not being here. We are joined by Natalie Marlowe. Hello. Hi, guys. Hello. It's so nice to have you. Hello. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Um, you are uh, the author of Needless Alley. Um, I am. And <laughs> please, could you just tell us about it to start off with? So uh, it's my first novel. It's a debut novel. Um, and it's the first in a series of novels starring my detective, William Garrett. Uh, the first novel, Nida Sally, is set in 1933 in Birmingham. And William is a private inquiry agent who specialises in finding evidence of adultery for divorce cases. Um, in those days, you needed physical proof of adultery if you wanted to divorce your wife. So William's job is to provide that evidence and oftentimes fabricate it. So with the help of his best friend, who's now to work actor, a man called Ronnie Edgerton, he sets up honey traps. The wives of the great and good of Birmingham, or not so good of Birmingham, and then photographs them uh, in flagrante in CD hotel bedrooms. Um, William falls in love, though, with the wife of a client. Um, and once that love affair starts, a series of events get going, which propels William into a kind of nightmarish, noirish situation. Uh, and the rest of the novel, he tries to disentangle himself from that situation. I don't want to give too much away because if I gave too much away, my editor would go crazy about spoilers. <laughs> exactly. I, I have to be kind of enigmatic when I talk about it. This is where you're covering well for Rob because he's usually the person that gives away everything. Gives away the spoilers. <laughs> he's always the spoiler it's so difficult. and we have to cut it out. Oh, man, I find it so difficult to talk about it without giving away massive spoilers. You've done well so yes, far. I guess when you Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so please can you tell us just about where... Um, I guess, where the idea for it came from? Well, I'm a lifelong fan of the crime fiction of the period. Um, so I began reading really inappropriate crime fiction as a child. <laughs> really inappropriate crime fiction as a child. Um, and I I do love British Golden Age um, crime fiction. I'm a big fan of Agatha Christie and a big fan of Sayers and Allingham. Um, but I began to read, perhaps at about 13, uh, hard-boiled detective fiction, um, passed on by my grandparents. Um, uh, both sides were massive readers and both sides were massive library goers. And when they finished their book, they would pass it on to me. So um, I read a lot of Chanda, a lot of Hammett, um, a lot of the classic noir stuff, James and Kane. Um, and it really did um, start something off. I think I think our, our tastes are developed in adolescence, aren't they? So the books, music, the sports teams we follow tend to be developed in adolescence. And for me, it was very much a an, an American hard-boiled uh, crime fiction sort of I became a fanatic I suppose um, and also a film noir uh, a big fan of film noir so Nida Sally is pretty much a love letter to that genre particularly Chandler uh, to be really nerdy about it I wrote Nida Sally using his rules of detective fiction writing in uh, The Simple Art of Murder um, so uh, down these mean streets, a man must go who's not himself mean. And that was my starting point for William. Uh, he was a, perhaps a man who's found himself in an immoral business, but he's not necessarily an immoral man at heart. There was something there that we can see in him that's moral, that's decent. Life for him. 
pretty much where I started. Um, and then again, um, it's a it's a love letter to the Midlands as well, and the people of the Midlands. I don't think I could write about anywhere else but the Midlands. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very much, I think it's very much part of me. I think it very much came as something organic rather than something that I uh, planned. Uh, you know, it wasn't something very conscious. It was just something I sat down and wrote what I really wanted to write. That makes sense. Yeah, it really does. And really interesting what you said about our sort of... Um loves and passions I guess mm. forming when you're young um Sean quick question for you um what, is there anything from your teenage years that have stuck around crime fiction yeah I think I, it, it's sort of that similar thing where you yeah you're reading things that you're not supposed to read um and maybe slightly earlier than my teens but um I remember going on a family holiday it was probably about 10 or 11. And on the shelf was Ed McBain. And it was this entire <laughs> world that I hadn't read of, you know, a seedy and sultry and, and, yeah. and, but, you know, like straight down the line, genre crime. But, yeah. and I, I read it and just went, fuck, this is a world. And, you know, I'd read, I'd, I'd snuck other things off my parents' shelves that would, but, you know, they were highbrow and literary and whatever, whatever. And then I just read this and went, oof. People is dying. <laughs> I love it. And it's and, juicy, yeah, isn't it? It's so yeah. juicy. The characterization is such a lot of fun and it's yeah. properly stuck with me. And I think even, you know, like Edward Bain's writing is also just it's it's hard and it's harsh and it's there's lots of G's and B's in there, you know, it's stuff that it's it's really guttural. Yeah. And completely outside the world of, you know, a kid on a Cornish holiday. Yeah. Transportative. Uh, but it, and it was completely, you know, it was one of those holidays where we, uh, it was pissing down the whole time. And, you know, it's sort of miserable walks, reluctant pre-teenager, pre mm. or whatever. And all you want to do is cozy up. And and you'd spend the whole walk not minding that you're getting absolutely soaked and freezing because that was your perfect excuse to go to your bed. And then you could get back into this book and I had to finish reading it before we finished the holiday because I couldn't take it with me because <laughs> it was on the it was on the shelf at the at the house we were staying in. So yeah, that that I think there's those things that and they really do. Like maybe if I'd read something else, Mills and Beans, I might have been <laughs> you know, doing Schmerotic fiction, but <laughs> you probably wouldn't be here. I'm sure Ed McBain would love that story, though. I'm sure he'd love to hear that story. I would have loved to hear that story that there was a small boy on a Cornish holiday getting really yeah. <laughs> into inappropriate yeah. crime fiction. <laughs> yeah, he's probably going, well, you know, it's it's life lessons, isn't it, kids? It is. No. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's so. It was so, and the the writing and everything that everything's so evocative and it's so transformative. And I think at the time I was just I was so ready to be lost in other worlds. That it's it's that yeah. kind of thing. And as you say, you I think those voices sort of linger in your subconscious. So where you've got Hammett and 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 everybody else sort of knocking at your your writerly door, going, oh. "We're here behind you. We're underneath you." those all of those words you've read that you've that you've been moved by sort of just support that voice as it's coming out which is and that's clear in yours yeah um I think um I think you don't realize it when you actually it's when you reflect on it I think you realize what your true influences are the true loves are there's plenty there's been plenty yeah. of reading in between my initial love of hard-boiled and noir, the American stuff. Um, but that's what came back to me in a kind of um, flourish, really, when I began to um, to write Nida Sally. It was, it was perhaps what came most naturally to me. Um, yeah. I think it's a lot to analyse there, the way writers work. The poetry of, of those classics that, um, that I think has been lost a little in the mainstream. Um, mm. And the thing that sort of makes you feel like this is a book worth reading is that, you know, you read a line again or again and think, yeah, that's got a different meaning now. 
mm. you know, as you get older or as you as you change, just to to read those things and think that's that's clever writing. There. Yeah. Yeah, they knew their stuff. <laughs> they knew how to bloody do it, didn't they? <laughs> um, can you tell us about um why nineteen thirty three and why Birmingham? Uh, 1933, because the divorce law changed in 36, it became less draconian. Um, and that's the simple reason. I think um, they still needed photographic evidence, but the law was equaled out. Um, for a woman, you needed proof of adultery, but also proof of cruelty. Um, so, And that would include um, uh, physical cruelty as well. Um, different kinds of sexual activity that I'm not necessarily going to go into on the podcast, but it was, it was quite draconian and there would have to be proof. Uh, yes, I suppose proof. Em emotional cruelty wouldn't necessarily have featured no. in, in the era. I mean, given, given how physically cruel the era was in itself. Yeah. So it would have... damaged my emotional health. That's it. Uh, no, it's not going to fly, is it? And um, no. and it really was, uh, uh, you know, photographic evidence or witnesses. So you would need um, witnesses to the fact that your husband beat you savagely. Uh, witness to the fact um, that your husband is adulterous. Um, uh, and the other reason was um, sodomy. Uh, so those were the reasons a, a woman could divorce her husband, plus adultery. Uh, with a man, a woman simply had to be adulterous. So um, what would often happen, and there is a really good novel, a, a contemporary novel, by a guy who was uh, campaigning to get the divorce laws changed. I can't remember the name of it off of my head. But what you could do, and this is what they do in that Fred and Ginger film, The Gay Divorcee, was that you, if you got, um, if you employed a gigolo together as a couple who didn't, who wanted to get divorced, you employed a gigolo and kind of fabricated the evidence together. So, and then you both go and purge yourselves in court. Um, and that, and that often would happen. Um, but obviously, for, um, in Needless Alley, um, uh, Ronnie and William set up honey traps on occasion for men who can afford it, um, because all you needed to do was, you know, have photographic proof of your wife being in a compromising position, another man in a hotel bedroom. So that's the three. I love it because <laughs> the. Um... The the hiring a juggler idea is like a really quick way out of the two year. You know, mm. it didn't work out, but we're gonna just still be married for two years, and if anything yeah. happens to us at that time, well done, you've got the life insurance. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, you know, they, in a, in those days, you could just go hire a juggler. You're out of here by next week. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, and I think there are there are the sorts of comic possibilities to be gigolo um and i think um i mean i mean it is beautifully comic but it's also really quite shocking and stark the length people went to to um to escape marriages that had failed um and obviously you know poor old william is making money the reason why he does it is he he makes money from it. It's a it's a nice little earner. He says it's a nice earner. Um, Birmingham. So why Birmingham? Uh, gosh. Well, uh, why not? <laughs> uh, that's my answer. Birmingham's a great city. Uh, it's got this amazing history. Um, it started off as just a collection of little villages, and then the industrial revolution hit, and it. In massive, both economically, physically, and then you still got the kind of lingering traces of village life. So, for example, Kings Heath is quite hit now. When uh, when my detective was a child, that was still a village. Um, 
I think a lot of the Tolkien stuff comes from, and I'm not a big Tolkien girl, you know, that wasn't one of my childhood passions. Um, but uh, I think the Tolkien stuff comes from the fact that when he went back to um, the Birmingham of his childhood, he felt, you know, that the, the suburbs have kind, of, have kind of been built and the villages had been destroyed. So you get that sense of like, um, industry destroying nature, industry destroying communities. Um, but Birmingham has this beautiful, rich history of poetry. We've got some great poets in Birmingham, great artists in Birmingham, um, but also um, this remarkable industrial history, which includes the canals. Yeah. Uh, with my I remember my sister lived in Moseley for a while back when I was at university, so, you know, a while ago, and it was such a burgeoning sort of, uh, artist musician area but in the back of where they lived were the woods that used to connect to the to another village that that was where you know part of that sort of whole Tolkien yeah. history it's a whole meal walk through those woods and think yeah I can see I can see exactly what he was describing here you know my brother-in-law had set up a BMX track and then you know this was not what he was describing but they do <laughs> like Hobbit mounds but <laughs> um but you can see and then you obviously that you know you've got the whole industrial not just all of the industry but you know that that sort of revolution of Cadbury's and, and yes uh, Bourneville, that village that was created as an industrial village, and it's oh. a massive area. Of... It's not just um, yeah, there's lots um, of soft industry, population. yeah. Like so, you've got the chocolate, but also bird's custard. That's a Birmingham thing. Yeah, real cream. If you want a nice early twentieth century male product, real cream. That's a brummy thing. Basically, Thai all food of the good tea. Stuff. Yeah, all the good stuff. <laughs> Thai food tea. And up and you know chocolate, you know. <laughs> and Sean and I first met in Birmingham. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Which is another good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of halfway between where we both were at the time. Yeah. That's <laughs> I amazing. was in Oxfordshire and Chris was up here and then the peak. So we were like, oh, let's get the train. We'll meet in Birmingham. There's a raft of your books on the table in the pub, and people are like, what's all this then? <laughs> oh. <laughs> So they were interested then. Yeah, no, that was, <laughs> that's great. People are, I think Birmingham people are lovely. Yeah, yeah, very nice friendly. Things. Yeah, and very funny, and great to talk to in pubs. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so, yeah, you said, so, "I'm sorry, Sam." No, no, I just saying it's it's got a very rich history to be unpicked. So it's nice that you've. You know, everybody knows that London's got a rich history that can be unpicked, but there's a lot written about that, and you know, yeah, both I, in I, fiction I, and, in, and in history. And actually, it's it's really nice to see that there's so much more, especially in crime and especially you know, like I mean, just look at Birmingham in terms of you know, the black country and in terms of the criminal gangs and in terms of everything else that's going on. You're like, there's mines, there's mines of stories to unpick here. Oh God, yeah, you're you're right, and um, an incredible landscape. Uh, oh man, do you know what I was going to say? I was going to say we've got such a great play. We've got so many brilliant places to hide bodies in the middle. Mm. You encourage that kind yeah, of train of thought on this podcast. I mean, it's such a terrible thing to say, but not really. Um... I mean, we've exhausted all of the places in the Lake Districts because <laughs> what. Once the lakes start drying up, and all you know, as oh, recently yeah, and yeah. all of the reservoirs around here dropped to minimal levels, you're like, well, if you put your bodies there, you bugger, don't you? <laughs> Just so. Come down here. I mean, we've got like old oh, gravel pits, hay pits. So all of the extraction industries that are now dead are all full of water. So you know, <laughs> if you wanna... you've heard it here first. <laughs> if people. you really want to get rid of a dead body. <laughs> The Coming black country the is the place to hide your dark deeds. Yeah. Absolutely. I like how you started off worrying <laughs> that you might give something away about your book and now if there's any suspicious no, crimes in Birmingham. No, I'm just, <laughs> no, just going to let you know that, you know, if you need anything, basically if you guys need me to move the body, you know where to put it. It's not, it's not it's, a problem. Send it into that. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> yeah. Stay in the ball. Drop it off. I'm your girl. <laughs> 
got, I've got it covered. <laughs> um, how yeah. much research went into um, a Birmingham of 1933? Um, because it feels very real and like you've sort of stepped into the, the streets and um, it made me think that, you know, an incredible amount of research must have got into it. Uh, yes. Well, thank you for that. Because um, that, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted it to feel like 1933. I wanted it to feel as real as I could possibly get it. Obviously, it's never going to be perfect because it's always going to be a cityscape of my imagination. And it's never going to be absolutely pristine, but I wanted it to, to do justice to that time. Um, part of it was easy because um, the grandparents that read, uh, they were great storytellers. Um, and uh, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother in particular, she was a fantastic storyteller. And so my bedtime stories with her would be about the time she she worked in the munitions factories and things like that. And she would say, oh, well, that used to be there and that was bombed. And then that used to, she would tell me where things were. Um, and I kind of remember um, from very early childhood, certain places, like my dad would drive in in his white van and he'd do things like pick up a compressor from Needles and I'd be like, all right, then I'll come with your dad. And he'd like drive in and I'd be in a white van and my dad would be you know, outside some early Victorian factory grabbing some kind of heavy equipment he needed and popping it in the back of his van. And um, the kind of cityscape was still there. That Victorian cityscape was still there. So I kind of drew on memories, my, my grandparents' memories, my memories of very early childhood. Um, but then I went, down like proper rabbit holes of research. Spent so much time in the National Newspaper Archive, um, reading about uh, what was going on news-wise, but also what really fascinated me were advertisements. Advertisements for draper shops, for bicycle shops, what shops were in Neva Sally, what was, you know, what did New Street look like? Um, so there's a scene in the Lion's Corner house and, and that's because I found there was a Lion's Corner house in Galloway Corner. So I, I popped it in. Um, so there was a tremendous amount of research gone on. Most of it probably wasted. Hardly, you know, lots of 5% went in because it was a, it's a lot of rabbit holes I went down. But that was the pleasure. I never wasted. I think it's, I think it's part of... It creates a texture that you as the author are not necessarily aware of, but you're distilling an entire period into sentences that make sense in the modern age mm -hmm. and have relevance and meaning. And I think you have to, by default, draw on, uh, on decades of research, on, on thinking and thoughts and stories told and it's interesting you say about grandparents that are good storytellers because that's where I started telling stories was sitting on my I'd run home from school and sit on my granddad's bed and he he was he had emphysema so he was on one of them big cylinders of mm. oxygen and he had his mask on and then I'd get us each a humbug off his thing on the shelf and then he couldn't breathe much and he was having his humbug so he'd just say you know, he'd give me the first line of a story and then I'd have to just sit there and <laughs> jibble on about whatever the story was and then, you know, like and until the humbugs were, were done. And that was that was our that was my childhood from like five, four, five, six, seven years old. But it it underpins your ability to keep somebody's attention. And and again, when you're looking around an environment like anything that I look at that is anything to do with the RAF or or you know the war or Cyprus or anything mm. else you're like I'm all about this why get the granddad yeah <laughs> just like that. yeah is there yeah, I, I think, think it, it amazing adds stuff resource. To that story that you can't yeah you can't you can't throw in just by going oh I'm writing a story there so I'd better look up about it in the library mm. Mm. It's different you know yeah I think um I think I, I, I've been thinking about this long and hard and I don't think I would have become a writer without my grandma. I, she didn't set out to sort of think, I want to 
intentionally make this child really into books. I didn't want, you know, she didn't set out to make me a reading child and she didn't set out to make me a storyteller. Um, but she just was so naturally good at it herself and so naturally um, she was so brilliant at recognising good story and, and conveying good story and I think that's perhaps where the inspiration came from really it was her and her story my great, my other granddad, my paternal granddad, he was quite a good storyteller as well but he told terrible stories really deeply deeply transgressive inappropriate stories that I was transfixed by about his own child hence your cut. love of noir <laughs> hence my love of noir and I was like oh no granddad no, you mustn't tell me that and he was like well it's too late now <laughs> I, I, um, my grand uh, both of uh, my maternal grandparents were both uh, great orators but um, I, I only I didn't I, I have no recollection of my grandmother, but she lives very strong in my mother. There's a lot of repeated phrase and uh, and personality there. I know from my uncle, he's a good twelve years older than my mum, but um, he's like, oh yeah, this. If you want to know your grandma Lillian, just look at your mother. <laughs> um, and my mum's very charismatic and very full of you know she's she can hold a room on any subject it's it's you know she has no problem um but my uh, my granddad on her side was he's quite a reserved military man mm. but he could tell a story and bring it like, and it was stories from his life but it's characters there was this fella and you'd get this three word description bloody faced mm. hectic and then you'd move on, and you know, like I, I was, I was, it was in the ages of four and seven is all I knew him, like all I know of him. Um, but I remember these descriptions. I remember, and it was always just you know. And when I was telling him the story, it's like too much detail. Cut it down. <laughs> just give, me, give me the things. Give me the who are the people? Why are they care? <laughs> and uh, it's just he was no storyteller. He was a pilot. Mm -hmm. But he, he was an ambassador and a, and a, 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 a teller of yarns. Mm. And they form you, don't they? Do you? The dark fibers. <laughs> anyway, so, that's got deep. Yeah, it's, quite, it's <laughs> heartwarming to listen to this. Lovely. Love grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're right. Like, yeah, without those being your formative childhood things, you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, storytelling's within my realm and, and for your grandmother it, she could have been an author but not at the time oh absolutely not no you know, no how's absolutely that not, realm? not yeah. Your thing. yeah absolutely not bless her i think she left school at 12 yeah wow no. yeah wow. no it was definitely the privilege of the the haves at that point definitely Especially yeah the women yeah, most definitely. You have to pretend to be men as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Th there was a lovely thing that you said just before about um, you, uh, about your detective would have been an, a certain age at a certain time. Um, mm -hmm. And I was just wondering about how you, um, how did you go about creating William? Um, was there a lot of thought into his backstory or, or how did it come about? Yeah, um, there was a lot, there was an awful lot of thought going to William. Um, firstly, like I said, I, I wrote him with that uh, Chandler quotation in mind, um, mean streets without being mean. And that was my starting <laughs> point. And then I really began to think about the men of interwar crime fiction, not just um, the American hard-boiled guys, but the, um, the men who feature in golden age crime fiction. Um, so for example, Lord Peter Whimsey suffered from PTSD. He needed Bunter to hold him at night. He needed his butler to hold him at night. Um, and, the, and it's just throwaway moments in Sayers where Whimsey suffers. Um, and we see a kind of giddiness in Campion, a post-war kind of bright young thing giddiness that doesn't feel quite grown up. And there's this sense of that I'm, I'm going to reject the adulthood in the very young man because adulthood necessitates fighting in wars 
and dying and seeing our friends die and doing despicable things to each other and it's not something that they necessarily wanted to be involved with and absolutely understood that um and again you've got a series of kind of damaged men in christie uh both post world war one and post world war two in the marbles you see an awful lot of men who are physically damaged um in christie and there is this vein throughout early 20th century literature of these men who have been damaged, traumatized by these wars. And um, in the American hard-boiled stuff, particularly 1940s post-war noir, you get this kind of fear in noir of the men coming back from war um, and what war has done to the um, the kind of pleasant small town American society. So these men have come back, they've fought in this awful war, they've witnessed terrible um, and they come back and, and what are the possibilities of having these men who are physically trained in combat, they know how to kill, uh, and there they are damaged. And, and, and these fears are somehow expressed in film noir, I think, particularly. Um, and this was kind of a heady mixture. And then if I go back to family history, both of my great grandfathers were quite severely injured in World War I. Um, and they both came back with um, incredibly damaged lungs. Uh, one went back into mining and died uh, an alcoholic. Um, and the other one uh, died in the 1940s, but more than likely of um, emphysema brought on by damaged lungs. Now, um, so these men had physical damage. Uh, there, there were men of that generation in my family who were emotionally damaged as well, traumatised. And in there, I remember them in their 90s having moments of trauma. And we do talk about it. We do talk about it in our culture about this damage. But in the crime fiction of the period, it's kind of hinted at. And I thought it's hinted at because perhaps to express it too formally is too close. It, it, it would have been too close for that to be yeah. fully expressed, particularly in genre fiction. Certainly, but I really I wanted to talk about it now, but not. Yeah, not absolutely. Not yeah. That's absolutely. Your escapism, not your... That's it. And you don't. And of course, genre fiction is escapism. Uh, but I wanted to be true to these men. I wanted to, to sort of honor these men to a certain extent by giving them perhaps a little bit of, of realism. There's something really strange about the American Hardball Detective, actually. Um, I'm a big fan of the Continental Lot. You know, Dashiell Hammett's a continental lot. And one of his best yeah. lines is in Red Harvest, and he, the continental, um, one of the characters says, I haven't laughed so much at something since the hogs at my kid brother. <laughs> my kind of story. <laughs> I mean, it's superb. It's a superb line. If you think about that, it was written in 1929. I haven't laughed so much at something since the hogs at my kid brother. Perfect line, yep. but it's dark. I mean, it's the yeah, darkest line. <laughs> it's so deeply, deeply dark, and so there is something kind of um, hard and violent and nihilistic and almost sociopathic about some of these hard world guys. Yeah, um, but I think that also comes from like if you look at that historical timeline. That comes from their experiences and their experiences, either parents coming back or themselves being young or old. And, you know, yeah. like, there's this whole, like every single iteration of the brutality of war That's... gets then distilled into a domestic situation, but with that absolute brutal yeah. realism that comes with what makes noir you know that transgressive stuff that you, you yeah <laughs> yeah and it's just so and it's a heady mixture and it's it's a lot to think about as a writer it's a lot to get your teeth into so William had that damage 
and I'm, I, I try and make that explicit that, that, that William is damaged and he's a man living with his trauma or trying to come through his trauma, be more than his trauma, be more than his childhood, be more than his experiences in war. There's a, oh gosh, I'm, this, is, this is a slight spoiler, but he says that he just wants to talk about books and art and all the things he's not allowed to talk about. So he meets a woman and he, he, he believes that he can talk about books and art and all the things he's not allowed to talk about with her. And that, that's his kind of salvation, that he can perhaps be gentler, more sensitive, more artistic. You know, he's more than just a, you know, he's more than just his fists. He's something, something he could be fully real, he could be a fully realised human being. That's um, what I was going to say. He's allowed to be human, but only yes. within certain confines. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's a hard character to write. It must have been quite hard to um, to piece together the avenue to take him, not to be too dark and not to be yes. soft for that yeah. period. You know, like yeah. to try and keep historically real, but to to allow him this sort of softness that people might have seen behind closed doors. Yeah. That we don't have reflected in culture from that time. Culture. Oh, I think so. I think you're <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think I think it is a behind closed doors thing. Um Yeah, it feels like it. But it but all the more endearing for it because that becomes then a, a rounded character that otherwise uh, you don't get to see. So you you feel the noir overtones but with an empathetic gentler character yeah that is a loud heart which is really hard to achieve so yeah it's lovely it's lovely oh, to you. play it's like <laughs> all you. things isn't it <laughs> trying to trying to create rounded characters for the modern age at the same time as trying to tell a story that's from a harder time yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, it's a delicate uh, line to tread. Um, just a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just do modern killing and shooting and stuff, and it's easy. Very <laughs> 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 really. What did Chan Chandler said? Um, if you get into trouble, you just need two, two guys to come into the room with a gun. And then, you know. <laughs> absolutely. And only one of them to know what they're doing. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I, do. I was once given the advice that there's nothing you've written yourself into in 10,000 words that you can't rewrite yourself out of in another 10,000 words. <laughs> so just keep going through it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of words for people to be dying. It's a lot of words. And I guess, uh, can you talk about the Red Hollow? Oh, yeah, I can I can talk a little bit about the Red Hollow. I don't know about you That's guys. Cool. Oh, man, I don't know if this is a debut thing. I just don't know if I'm not used to it. I, I find it absolutely impossible to talk about the Red Hollow without giving away all of the plot points. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you go, oh, you, yeah, what's the second one about? And I go, it's about this, 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 and this, and then this happens in the end. Oh, boy. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> oh, so um, the Red Hollow is the second in the series, and oh. yeah, it features William, Bill, and Queenie. And um, in oh boy, am I going to give away spoilers? Oh, don't. Do, can you tell us when it's out? <laughs> when it's out next year. <laughs> so, oh, no. I am so sorry, guys. I'm so sorry for being absolutely rubbish. No, no, no. I, I think no, it's anybody fine. Normally, the people are like, wait, do you know the title? How do you know? The title? <laughs> I do. You know, I know the title and I know the name of the detective and I know what it's about and I can tell you, but I didn't tell you. It's probably it for the best. Just tell you the whole story. <laughs> yeah, Perfect. give us I'm the audiobook so now, unabridged. <laughs> we can say it's going to be really good. Oh, yeah, it's going to be excellent. Thank you. And it's a great title. It's It's a really great title. Watch this space. (laughs) Oh, boy, I'm so sorry. I'll I'll move us on in a nice segue. Would you like to play a game? Come on, then. Oh, God. Now, um, 
it's called the one star game and uh, one star superstar and usually what we do is we look at the book of of the guests that we have and we look at a one star review that they got and then look at what else that person reviewed um but you don't have any one star reviews so oh <laughs> john i've gone back to the thing you're going for mine again i've gone <laughs> Sick of those one star people. They can <laughs> I've gone back to the original way of doing it. So okay. we're going to play the original game where I have well, this found... This is much harder. Well, so, it so... is. This I is find... much harder. Think... Yeah. So I find one star reviews of other books and oh. you have to try and guess what um, what book it is. Um, okay. they're, they're well-known books, so you should hopefully know of the book. But all this does is expose my ignorance of mainstream. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have kind of put off as well. I'm rubbish at, I, you know, I well, live in 1933. Oh, boy, I'm going to be really bad at this. <laughs> I'll give you a hint if you're, if you're struggling. Oh, thank okay, you. Good. Good. Okay. Right. Um, okay, so one star, the letdown of the millennium. Answer me this. Can you read a book where the author describes a twig for five pages? If the answer is no, don't bother. If the answer is yes, then enjoy. A twig. <laughs> is this a fiction book? It is a fiction book, yeah. A classic. This is not The Lord of the Rings, is it? No. I was thinking about ends and what have you. Yeah, no, that's a really good end. It's, um, you're very close with the title. Oh, not the Lord of the Flies. Yeah, it is Lord <laughs> of the Flies. Well <laughs> <laughs> you really describe a twig for Apparently so. Or maybe the person's I don't just... remember that. Yeah, maybe he's misunderstood. I just remember kids beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> That's it. Poor old Piggy. Yeah. I so... don't remember any navel gazing about botanicals, but, you know, <laughs> it was a long time ago when I read it. <laughs> That certainly didn't come up in any GCSE I might have done. Wow. Um, um, right, Natalie, you're one nil up. Um, book two. Not that great. One star. Sorry to go <laughs> against the grain and be individual, but I've just finished it and it wasn't that good. Every time it looked like getting exciting, they just run and hide. Nothing major happens ever. I was really disappointed. They just run and hide. Is this Lord of the Rings? <laughs> this is Lord of the Rings, yeah. Because <laughs> they do. They're yeah. very they just people. <laughs> you just have to run and hide on the you would if you were being chased by orcs and elves and Yeah. You just have to run and hide. Realism in the fantasy genre. You would have just bloody well run and hide, wouldn't you? If I was a hobbit. And I, I actually look like a hobbit. <laughs> Very small, hairy feet, run and hide. That's all you've got to yeah. know. <laughs> um, and I guess this is for the um, the decider here. The um, decider. Okay. Um, oh. Right. Uh, one star, a complete bore. Oh. Um, this book should not be placed in the same class with the other classic authors who deserve their place. This book is a bore. The main character is a whiny crybaby, and the book goes nowhere for a long time. The main character has a very thick skull, and all the obvious things fly over her head. The book should not be a classic, and I do not understand why it is one. Is it Jane Eyre? Oh, it I was say Jane Eyre. <laughs> oh man! I think Sean, this might have been my, I think that might have been my A level essay. <laughs> <laughs> I hated that woman. She was oh, so man. That is impressive <laughs> speed. Oh, he was so quick, wasn't he? Yeah, I'm I sorry, thought catch really in the eye until you said girl. I, was, I thought I was catch in the eye. I was going catch her the eye until she until he said her thick skull and I was like Jane Eyre. Wow, well, that is impressive. Well, well done, both. Yeah, that was that was a good um, good battle. Look at that in our classic literary education. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, my <laughs> South Walian comprehensive English teachers. <laughs> Solid. Well, superior, superior work. 
Yeah, that was that was a fantastic battle. Probably the best we've had. So well done. <laughs> Um, Nail biting. <laughs> yeah, it was. It really was. I think our listeners will be. Um, they won't have time to answer. You're both straight in. <laughs> we did. We really did nail that. You did fantastic. What a start to the year. It can only go downhill from here. <laughs> yeah, let's not go back to the old game. This one's much better. I'm better <laughs> at. <this. laughs> I'm much better at this than guessing that somebody who didn't like one of our guest books also didn't like a pair of tights. <laughs> 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 There's no context to that. No, Thanks there really that. isn't. There's no context to Anyway. Oh, you did well. well um, Natalie, we're, we're sort of coming to the end of our time, really, and um, we usually end on what book are you reading at the minute? Oh, gosh. Um, I am actually listening to things on Audible at the minute. Um, so I have just, um, finished listening to Died in the Wall by Nio Marsh, just to go back to the classics. Lovely. Oh, I told you I lived in 1933. I'm so, <laughs> I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed. By, Don't be. No. By my, uh, uh, elderly woman's reading habits. <laughs> but yes, I, yeah, Died in the Wall by Nio Marsh, highly recommended. An excellent murder mystery with a really nice setting as well up in the hills in New Zealand. I'd love to go one day. Very nice. Yeah. And do you know what's what's coming next? Now that you've finished it? Um, oh, do you know, I think I want to read um, Hey Papkinson, Shrines of Grady. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good show. Uh, yeah. 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 Have, have you guys read it yet? No. Not yet, no. But it's definitely sitting there waiting on the... Yeah, I'm really tempted by it. Do it. I have to make myself a cocktail and put my feet up. Yeah, definitely. It's that kind of it's that kind of time, isn't it? Mm. Nice cocktail. Warms mm. up. Oh, yeah. Feet up. Nobody bother me. Yeah. yeah. If only. If only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can be trained. Uh, and Sean, what about you? I'm I'm reading. Uh, well, Mrs. C got me Black Holes by Professor Ooh. Brad Cox, which is all about. It's exactly what it is. It's all about black holes and how um, there's there's these bits of space and time that um, if you if you were to send your rocket into them you'd disappear but for all eternity we'd see you frozen on the edge of it huh because once you've gone into the black hole all time evaporates and you're in no time so you'd be gone but you'd always be fixed it's the most amazing book but it's informing the book that you know chris that i'm trying to write yeah that's really good and now i'm just meshing my head with more things, but at least it's got a lovely rainbow spine. Oh, it does. Look <laughs> at that. It, it's absolutely incredible for science and everything else, but they, they get, they're getting so close to understanding that energy, that vortex of energy that gets sucked into a black hole that uh, is both the absence of energy and the sum of all energy in one place. It's, ma- it's mad. It meshes your brain. Yeah, it hurts my uh, head. Uh, yeah, my, making, my, mind is, my mind is completely blown by that. Making, I'm making it into fiction, but yeah, Mrs. C bought it for me for, for my Christmas. Oh, so I'm working nice. through it with little post-it notes going, this is important, try and make it work in your fiction <laughs> script. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, oh. what are you reading, Chris? I am reading um, Magpie Murders by Anthony Horowitz. Oh. Um, we've chosen it as, I've started a book club at school, or well, restarted it I guess um, and that's what I chose very democratically for because um, <laughs> you know like what time groups you tend to throw yeah. in like a few suggestions and people are like yeah yeah like I'm happy with whatever so I was like right here are two options pick one and then people did the wishy-washy thing so I said this I want to read this one so let's do that one. yeah so that's, that's the way it works one <laughs> Yes, and I mean, I just finished his Hawthorne. Uh, there's four of them, and they are amazing. And I think he was 
he was so lovely when we had him on, wasn't he, Sean? And <laughs> he's just so clever. So this, yeah, I'm loving it. I'm about 200 pages in and it's warpy, mind warpy again. Not not black holes mind warpy, but crime fiction mind yeah. warpy. <laughs> yeah, good plotting. <laughs> yeah. Really clever. Yeah. So yeah, okay. that's it. Good um, one, book club. Say again. Good one, book club. Yeah, I think I think it'll be a good one for discussion because I'm gonna, I can imagine people that don't read a lot of crime fiction finding it a tricky starting point, maybe because it's sort of a book within a book, but then there's bits mm. on either side of it and things. So, um, I think it'll be good for discussion, really. Um, yeah, I'm loving it. So yeah. <laughs> And that's all that matters to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're loving it. The so important you're thing. Yeah. <laughs> I picked a good book and everyone has to live with it, so all good. <laughs> well, you're just too stupid to understand. It. Yeah. <laughs> well, my brain pulses. <laughs> um, Natalie, thank you so, so much uh, for joining us tonight. It's been such a good start. And um, uh, I mean, Needless Alley is brilliant so anybody that uh, is listening and hasn't read it yet please do go out and get oh, it yeah. get it read come on oh, thank you guys thank you for inviting me it's been lovely to chat in your pub <laughs> yeah it's nice <laughs> to be back isn't it yeah. and, um, nice to be back in the pub. <laughs> and you'll have to come back for round two of one star superstar at some point and, and yeah oh yeah i actually i do i need to win next time I need to yeah. Win. yeah i think i think for us we'll keep this version Yes, you should. I need to get into training. <laughs> 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 That's it. Like Rocky. What's the author equivalent of running up some stairs? It's rapidly flicking through. Yeah, those. that's it. Yeah, one star reviews. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> memorizing them. Yeah. <laughs> All those frustrated A-level students who can't bear their texts, like yeah. one-star reviews. <laughs> Straight on the York notes. That's it. This is a Daredevil student. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, amazing. Well, yeah, thank you so, so much. And um, we will see you again somewhere down the line. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you thank later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.